Welcome to Melted. This is Frankie Melted Chapsticks Hollywood, your host, lead singer of the Melted Chapsticks. Tonight we have a very special guest, Mike Lefton of the Dives. The Dives are a power trio consisting of Jimmy Mayer on drums, Sergio Ortega on bass, and Mike Lefton on guitar and vocals. You have heard of them since 2017. They started in 2016. They are an amazing group. Got to tour Europe. We're excited to talk about their adventures and their new video, Ready Player One, which just came out. They also have a couple other great videos that are up on YouTube. Uh, Blue Light and Stop Sending Emails to My Mom. I mean, I may have problems, but you need to stop sending emails to my mom. Hmm, but I'm really excited. We are sponsored by Carlino Guitars. Eddie is a magician. He works masterpieces. Carlino Guitars is located 135 Mystic Ave in Medford. Open Sunday 11 to 7, Monday through Friday 11 to 9. Saturday, 10 to 7, he's always there. His amazing straps, guitars, amplifiers, lessons by Joe Filoni. He'll do a quick setup. He did one for my birthday. He just wants me to play better. Eddie is awesome, has everything you need, including the T-shirts, a line of his own guitars, as well as different models from different uh, brands, such as Dean, etc., but uh, he also made a blinged out one for me several years ago, which I'm very appreciative of. But I'm really excited to talk to Mike Lefton just about the dives and where they're headed and some of their history. Uh, they do put out some serious sounds, how they create their great songs. They played at the O2 Arena, which is exciting, as well as Kiss Cruise and you know touring nationally. So it's always nice to get a perspective from a band, where they've been, where they're going, and they are amazing. Mike is from the Garden State, along with Jimmy Mayer, their drummer. We love New Jersey, till it comes to sports, and there's a small problem. And maybe Boston's the problem. And a warm, melted welcome to Mike Lefton of The Dives. How are you? Hello, Frankie. OMG. OMG, indeed. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How about yourself? You know what? No complaints in the midst of it all, and that's what I was going to check in on with you. It seems like you guys have been quite busy putting up uh, Ready Player One, which I love the video and the music. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we have been very busy plugging away at that. Uh, you know, we've had that we've had that in the can for some time now, and we were kind of uh, really working hard to get the video together and make sure that it was absolutely perfect. And, uh, you know, ready to uh, to be released to the public. And finally it went out and we were so relieved that not only that it was out, but that it was being so well received. No, for sure. It looked like, did you film some of that in New York City? No. So we actually filmed all of that in uh, Patterson, New Jersey. Okay. At a, um, this uh, kind of a, I guess, kind of like a warehouse, but like you can rent it out for events. I forget the name of it. It's in the video. I, I feel like an idiot that I don't know no, no. what the what the name of it is right now. But it's it's there in Patterson, and uh, we did a, the opening shots were done uh, at a different location, also in Jersey. So actually, none of that is New York. Okay, I but just, it does the, have a New York vibe. It really does. Uh, with I, I just saw some of the street scenes for sure. And who shot the video then? That was a buddy of mine, Nick Capra. Uh, I went to film school with him and uh, we've kept in touch over the years. He's also a musician. And uh, so we've always had a lot in common in that way. And uh, when it came time to start doing our music videos, uh, I immediately thought of him because I I've seen his stuff. Like I said, we've kept in touch and I've seen his films as he's released them and he's done other music videos. He does wedding videos. In fact, he shot the wedding video for my sister and her husband. So, nice. yeah, so we've definitely remained friends since college. And uh, so when we when it came time to start doing videos, I thought Nick would be really good. He's got he's a good guy and he's got a good sensibility for 
you know, what our aesthetic is and he can bring a lot of his ideas to the table and we just get along really well and we have a, a great rapport with him. So we had a lot of fun shooting the blue light video as well as this, the new one for ready player one. Nice. So when yourself, Jimmy and Sergio write a song like ready player one, is it kind of the same throughout all your songwriting with, you know, stop sending emails to my mom, blue light, <laughs> this one. Uh, how does that process work? Well, it's a little bit different now with COVID and being separated from each other and all that. So we'll get into that a little bit later. But for for those songs that were all written, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, um, they one of us will just come up with like a weird idea. Uh, and so, so for example, stop sending emails to my mom is in fact ba based on a true story that happened to, uh, Jimmy. And, uh, I think he was, you know, talking to one of us about it, or maybe it was our producer, Bob, and he was just getting real upset. And he was like, God, I wish you would just stop sending emails to my mom. And they went, that's, that's the song right there. Like all it <laughs> just, you know, fill in the blanks really. And that song kind of wrote itself. Uh, so for and then for blue light, um, again, you know, it's like we just have these discussions that turn into sort of we we have like a weird a weird language between the three of us that only we understand, and we'll we'll hit on an idea that'll make us go, oh, okay, that's that's odd, that's an interesting phrase, or that's an interesting little chord progression, and we'll just kind of work together and build on it, and it doesn't really matter who has the idea, it's you know whoever's got the best idea for the song and we just kind of build on top of that yeah you're i have friends at dartmouth that speak their own language as well you're your own <laughs> ivy league college and i like it. <laughs> the dive the dives college <laughs> oh my gosh i love it um and it seemed like with ready player one it seemed like a tech a lot of technology references as That's well right. it seemed like sort of some sort of love interest in there. Am I correct? You are a hundred percent correct. So that song was mostly written by Sergio um, with input from our producer, Bob as well. So they kind of worked on that one, mostly them. And Serge was a big uh, video game fan growing up. And he, he just sort of retained a lot of those tech technical words like monophonic and uh, things like that. And, he, you know, he, he's sort of nerdy in that. We're all nerdy in our own ways, but he's he's nerdy in the uh, in the video game world. And he just thought it would be really weird and funny if there was, you know, a song about a video game that falls in love with the player. Mm. And so, you know, because there are, are people who get so into the video games that, you know, they will fall in love with their avatar or someone else in the game. You know, they'll get so into it. So in this case, this is sort of turning that on its head and doing the reverse of it. So that's that's where the song came from. And so when it came time to do the video, it was really, well, we've got so many ideas for this. Like we could, the video game could suck the band into it and we could be playing through the different levels and try, trying to get ourselves out of the game. And, you know, it's, the, 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 the ideas were endless for that one. So you are 100% correct in uh, picking up all of that. Well, Mike, uh, we're a little closer than you think with AI uh, <laughs> falling in love with us. <laughs> uh, <It's, laughs> I, 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 we're right on the cusp of it. No, absolutely. And I love how you guys leveled up in the video as well. Yes, that's right. Um, as far as going into blue light, mm -hmm. who is the ghost in the pale blue light? Ah, uh that that's that's the mystery isn't it <laughs> yes it is who and we you, want answers you, on melted <laughs> who do you who do you think the ghost in the pale blue light is sir oh my gosh could be anything it's up to interpretation it sure is uh the so blue light was really all about the the sort of perils of online dating mm -hmm. and how uh you know, per, people's profiles on these different sites and apps can be very 
misleading and one dimensional and you'll you'll start talking to somebody and you think you'll click and then you know it just kind of completely falls apart it for no real reason it just kind of happens and we've all i think had our, our our own perils in dating whether they've been online or or not um so and the the pale blue light is really a reference to the phone and the light that comes from the phone and people who are so you know engrossed in what they're doing on the phone that they kind of um they don't pay attention to the real world so the pale blue light is really the phone light now the ghost in the pale blue light that's up to your interpretation who that is or what that that's about but that's that's where that song kind of came from no and i love the video of the blue lights underneath you the aesthetic Mm. who shot that also nick also nick capra i want to thank nick no it it really turned out well i um, am I, I'm not on Tinder at the moment, but I do joke with people that everybody's looking much better with masks on, so I'm swiping right. On on so many more people, right? It's like you only have to look good half of your face. <laughs> Let alone may, maybe people taking shower optional with being locked in the house all the time. I also yeah, you'll, you'll never know. <laughs> you just don't. I actually uh, tried okay stupid. I mean, okay cupid. Uh <laughs> Met a beautiful Russian girl at a Starbucks. First three questions to me. How much money do you make? Where do you work? When do you want to make a baby? Um, (laughs) That's when I say, check, please. I actually said, you look so good. Let's pop in the bathroom and start the family. Best 20 seconds of your life in 30 seconds with Viagra. Then she said, I dated somebody from your town. And I said, did you like them? Not the doll. I said, that's funny because about four years ago, you and I slept together. She was talking about me. Oh, my God. And didn't recognize me with my long hair. Oh. So I'm staying in from now on. I am taking. Wait, did you recognize her? Oh, the second she walked in, I go, no. (laughs) And even with the text the second time around, they were eerily familiar. You were like, this, I feel like I've had this conversation before. (laughs) So I, I did meet uh, the ghost in the pale blue light. That's your ghost. You met your ghost. See, you didn't have to ask me. You knew all along. The answer is, was inside you. It is. Um, as far as I really love the video as well with Stop Sending Emails to My Mom. because <laughs> Thank you. You guys, when... You know, you come up with the bar scene. I thought of Cheers immediately being from Boston. Uh Uh-huh. And then it was just your rant, and it went into, and then I thought about the lyrics. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I've got flaws and issues, which I'm thinking, yeah. But stop sending emails to my mom. It seems like anything else that I've been doing is really okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if I'm not sending emails to somebody's mom, I was like, wow. Um, well, let's let's go on record as saying not everything else is okay, but that that particular <laughs> that, that particular thing can be quite annoying after a while. So yeah, that uh <laughs> quite an interesting time doing the I'm I'm interesting that you thought thought of it in that way. But uh, no, that was a fun video to shoot, and uh, that one I directed. Nice. And and uh, a friend of ours, Jeremy Lebled, did uh, the cinematography on it, and that was a fun. And we just showed up to this bar. You know, we had asked them if we could shoot a little video, and they had this little downstairs private area for like parties and things. You could book it, and uh, so nobody was using it this particular day. So we, you know, were able to go down and shoot this this really strange little video. And the funny thing was there were actually people dining upstairs, like eating their tuna salad and like look, looking down at, a, at, at these three weirdos in makeup making this video. It was the most bizarre experience. No, I, I also love at the end, um, is this guy crazy? Yes, he's <laughs> cray cray. And just the fact of, you know, switching up, you know, wardrobe in a way, We've got grandma behind the bar now. <laughs> it was it, it was really clever. Thank you. It, it was a wild time. 
the uh, the idea that this guy is getting so drunk that the bar patrons are turning into his ex and his mother. Yeah, dear diary, that's one of the reasons why I have laid off the alcohol for ten years. Um, Good for you! Congratulations. <laughs> thank you so much. I my hair's long enough; I can turn water into wine, which is nice. And that's I can, nice. I can be around it. So, ah, you can be around it. Your your holy your holiness can be around it. <laughs> yes, that's terrific. Um, so tell me about your manager, Lynn Lindway. Lynn is the best. We absolutely adore her, um, at, mainly because she is w- one of the only people that will absolutely never blow smoke up our ass. She is just anything that we need to know, she will tell us. You know, she loves us to death, but anything we're doing wrong or anything we could be doing better, or if we're working on a song that we really dig, and she's like, nope, it's not going to work. We'll be like, oh, what do we got to do to fix it? So, like, she kind of, she has the answers that we always need. And anytime we're, like, stuck on an idea, should we do this, should we do that, it's always, let's text Lynn first, because she'll know. So she's she's been amazing to us the past, um, gosh, five years? Six years? Long time. Yeah, well, when did it, the dives officially form then? It was 2016 or 2015? Well, the seeds were sort of planted in 2015. Um, I had met Jimmy at a, an open mic night that he used to run in Bergenfield, New Jersey. And um, uh, I had been also that same month had met Evan, who used to be in the band. We used to be four, now we're three. Um, So I had met him that same month. And Jimmy at that time was not really, oh, and and Evan knew Serge. So they were playing together and I was playing with Jimmy. And I had met Evan and he had been looking for uh, another guitar player to round out his band. But he didn't have a drummer yet either. There was another guy that was just sort of substituting till he could find a regular drummer. so it didn't officially come together until the following year when we finally convinced Sergio to officially join. And Jimmy had just previous, like early 2016, Jimmy had officially joined. So that that's really when we started. So at this point now, it is five years for us. Wow. And then where did you meet Lynn? Lynn had known, um, well, Lynn, is, our, our producer, Bob, that his, his his wife is Lynn. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so it was pretty cool that they kind of came together. You know, I, I had met Bob, um, Bobby Held, the great Bobby Held, uh, at, in New York at the Cutting Room for uh, like a, a an event that was um, celebrating the sort of the legacy of 48th Street and Music Row. I don't know if you're familiar with all the music stores that used to be on 48th street in New York, like Manny's okay. and the places like that. So uh, those have all, they have all closed down, unfortunately. So this was sort of like a celebration of that. And there were all these musicians that came together and uh, I wasn't scheduled to play by any means, but I had my guitar with me because I was, I was told that at the end of the night, they may have like an open jam and I might get a chance to play with some of these guys. So I had my guitar with me. And uh, the, the end of the night came around and, you know, they're doing their last song. And I thought, OK, well, that's a bust. Didn't get to play. But the the, uh, the guy who was kind of in charge of getting all the musicians on stage, he came running over to me with his flashlight and he's sticking the flashlight in my face. He's saying, come on, get up. Now's your chance. And I'm like, they're in the middle of their last song already. But he was like, don't worry about it. Just go up. And he took me up on the stage. And Mark Hudson was actually singing, and it was uh, Tush, I think was the song we were doing. And uh, he saw, I had plugged in, I started playing a little rhythm, and it was time for a solo. And he he just kind of spotted me on stage, and he dragged me to the front of the stage, and I start playing this blues solo. And Bob Held happened to be doing sound that night. So he saw me for this like 90 seconds that I was on stage, playing this solo and afterward 
um, he came and talked to me and he was like, hey, I liked your playing. I thought you were really good. Um, I'm a producer. I'd like to talk to you at some point. Maybe we could do something. I don't know what your situation is, if you're in a band, if you're looking for a band. And so I started talking to him that way. And it was his idea to uh, pair me with Evan, who was looking for another guitar player. So it was, it was this weird kind of circle of events kind of falling into the right place at the right time. And so I met Bob and then eventually I met Lynn and and the, here we are today. Oh, I enjoy kismet and good karma and you have it. I was very lucky in that situation that it all kind of worked out that way. Definitely was a life-changing night for me. No, oh, absolutely. And when did you start playing yourself? Because you're a fantastic musician and player. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I um, So I started playing when I was just nine years old. Um, I was a big, big Beatles fan growing up. And uh, I didn't really... It's kind of a funny story how I started playing because I really didn't have any aspirations to be a musician. I just really liked their music. And so I was about nine years old and uh, I had like a, um, a tiny little nylon string acoustic guitar that I didn't know how to play. And it sort of sat in the corner collecting dust. And uh, we went, my, me and my family went into New York because we're, we're, we're in Jersey. So we're very close to New York. And around the Christmas time, we always like to go and see Rockefeller Center and look at the Macy's window display and all that. So I was nine years old and my dad decided to take me to 48th Street. You know, it's funny how that kind of came full circle later on. But we went to 48th Street and he took me to all these music stores. And um, in one of these stores, there was a Rickenbacker guitar that was identical to the one John Lennon used to use with the Beatles. You know, the black and white Rickenbacker guitar. And I immediately spotted it. You know, you that's such an such a recognizable guitar and i saw it and i thought oh i i want this like this is awesome and my dad was like um no it's fifteen hundred dollars and you don't know how to play and i was like no of course i i, I can play what are you talking about so to kind of humor me uh my dad asked the guy working there hey can you just like let let the kid hold it for a second and of course i held it and just kind of went bling bling i didn't know what the hell i was doing and uh so he, he he got down he was like michael look you cannot play this guitar so i'm not going to buy it however if you learn how to play guitar one day i will get you that guitar so that night i actually went home and i said can we start learning and he was like, wait, you really want to learn how to play? And I was like, yeah, I really want to learn. And the, so the only reason I actually wanted to start was because I wanted a guitar that looked pretty cool. And that was base, and it started from there. And I just kind of, I don't know, it just sort of clicked with me. I learned really quickly. And my dad's a bass player, um, but he does play guitar. So he he taught me the initial, you know, few open chords and how to play bar chords and then eventually I started to surpass him and he sort of was like well I can't teach you anymore so we'll either get you a, a teacher or you'll have to learn on your own and so I honestly started learning on my own I started listening to uh, different albums and you know listening to lead guitar parts and rhythm guitar parts and just listening I, I didn't I didn't read music and I never understood how tabs worked. I still don't know how people are comfortable reading tabs. Uh, and I just used my ear and listened to a lot of music and just absorbed it all and started learning kind of on my own. And I've been almost entirely self-taught since maybe the age of 13 or so, something like that. So it's been, it's been 20 years since I started. Well, you're so driven that... I want you to tell me the story about your dad playing backup for you or you for him. Oh, wow. Well, we, we played together a lot when we were, when I was younger. And even when I got into like my teens and early twenties, we played together a lot because we used to go to a lot of blues open mic nights. Um, Cause you could just, 
it's just great learning experience to play live we used to go every single week like we would go to different ones every week and just go to different blues jams and play with different people and uh but of course we have the same a lot of the same music taste so we would jam together in the basement and we'd practice harmonizing together so we did a lot of that especially growing up um you know we'd go to people's parties where they'd have musicians playing in the backyard like fourth of july things and uh, people would be playing music in the backyard and we would you know learn songs and jam out together and uh yeah we did that for many many years actually so uh a lot of times we would uh, be kind of like a package deal like yep here come the leftons and the two of us would go on stage <laughs> and do our little sets and uh it was great it was great yeah he was uh he taught me a lot and i think I think eventually I taught him a lot too. No, for sure. And I think that's great to have such a bond in music. Um, it's a really beautiful thing. So being a musician myself, I have dreams. We throw things out into the universe. You get your first guitar. Hmm. Start your band. And then tour Europe, the U.S., play the O2 Arena play a kiss cruise that's right did you imagine that yourself no i didn't i always wanted it but i never imagined it i never imagined it would actually happen particularly because when i graduated college in 2015 uh i went to school for film and i had previously been in a couple of bands that just kind of didn't work out and i didn't i wasn't gonna give up music for, by any means but i really didn't see another situation happening where i would you know really be in another really good successful band and, and do all that kind of the cool stuff that you you mentioned but it just so happened that later on that year was when i met up with jimmy and evan and serge and formed this little little band and i never imagined that it would take us to all those places it was really uh some of the some of the highlights of my life have been with this band absolutely and as far as yeah because it is a it's a huge deal to do these things um you know with your set list because you had a ep at the time that's right how long were your sets in Europe, in the U.S.? Um, we always did a half-hour set. Okay. Which was a nice a nice chunk of time, actually, because sometimes they don't want openers to play too long, so they'll, you know, maybe do like 15 minutes. But they were, Kiss and the Dead Daisies were very good to us for our, our opening sets. So we, we had a, but it was a strict half-hour, like a half-hour and then you're done. So we made sure to we really, really rehearsed our set for those for those tours to make sure that even with like the little bit of talking that we did in between <laughs> songs, like we would we would play the show, you know, in the basement or in the studio, wherever we were rehearsing, like start to finish, start the timer on the iPhone, you know, do all the little talking bits in the middle, like we're going to time it to the second to make sure that everything we do is going to be right in that half hour period. And we, we really nailed it. I have to say for those tours. Well, I'm really good between the songs. I would, I would just have to say, where are my green M&Ms? And <laughs> as my mother says, you need lessons, but stay between the songs. And I'm like, thank you. But it's really, <laughs> it's really um, good advice. Yes. We all listen, <laughs> listen to mom. But yeah, so you, you had it down to the 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, how many dates was it in Europe? Um, well, it was kind of crazy, the timing of our tour in Europe. Because, so we had four scheduled arena shows to open with Kiss. And we had one solo show at a club called the Water Rats in London. Um, but the week prior um was when the there was that bombing in the manchester arena i don't know yes, if you remember yes, that at the, yes at the at the ariana grande concert 
we were scheduled to play at that arena the following week and that show got canceled. Yeah. So it was really strange timing for us to go over there. Um, and we were definitely a little nervous at that point because, you know, I've never heard of anything like that happening before. So it was supposed to be five dates, one being a solo us headlining show. And uh, it got cut down to the three arena shows, which were Glasgow, Birmingham and London and the one club date in London. So four shows, really. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, just, you know, and that's a dream of mine. Were there any takeaways from that with hundreds of thousands of people jumping up and down? Oh, God, yeah. It was <laughs> extremely eye-opening. You, you kind of, um, well, it's funny, you know, obviously as a musician, you have heard people say, like, you got to play every show you know, like you're at Madison Square Garden playing for 50,000 people, but you don't really know what that feels like until you're in front of 50,000 people <laughs> actually doing it. So walking onto the stage the first night in Glasgow was like, oh, no, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Excuse my German, but fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it was very much expletive after expletive uh walking onto that stage the first night and the glasgow arena i think was the sse hydro that was the smallest of the three arenas so i mean and it's it, it was very big but each show progressively got bigger and uh i would honestly say that by the time we did the second show in birmingham we were suddenly very comfortable I think we just had to get the first one out of the way and get the nerves, you know, wash those away. And then suddenly it was like, oh, OK, we kind of know how to do this. Like, sure, we're not we're not Kiss. We're not, you know, the masters of putting on a live show yet. But well, you it was pretty cut. <laughs> Once we got the hang of it, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, Mike, I know who to call if I need an arena show. Hey, we got a quick arena show, 100,000 people. Let me call somebody who's done it, which is you, which is, which is wow. Say it backwards, wow, upside down, mom. <laughs> and I like the fact that, you know, of course, you know, your first show, but it progressively got easier. Um, yeah. As far as... Did you, because I saw you, I think it was in Baltimore with the Dead Daisies as well. Did you continue on with them or was that the same tour? That was a different tour. So we had met the Daisies on the first Kiss Cruise we did in 2016 and we got to know them a little bit. And they were really cool with us and they were looking for an opener for their um, Dirty Dozen tour that they were doing in August of um, 2017. And they asked us if we wanted to do it and we had just done the kiss tour uh, and to add on to what we took away from doing those arena shows was suddenly our club dates in new york got considerably better because then we really had a much better idea of what it meant to really you know give it a, a thousand percent when you're playing for an audience so we were very uh we learned very quickly how to do that so when it came time for the daisies to ask us to do this tour with them we were like absolutely you know when and where you know we'll be there and that was that was a really that was also an amazing experience getting to do that because that was the first re that was 12 shows around the united states that was all over the place so that was the first time for me at least uh doing anything of that kind of scale how did you travel with that um part of the way sometimes we drove we'd rent cars and drive from so like from my place i remember we drove from my place to um baltimore and then i think from baltimore to some i never we definitely drove from nashville to dallas and that was that was a hell of a drive i did most of that driving by the way <laughs> that was like 14 hours of driving that was tough but part of the way we also flew so I think we flew from Dallas to L.A., I believe. And then uh, 
Oh, uh, what did we do? I think we flew from for the first the first date was in Chicago. But I think we flew to that one, and then we also flew from Dallas to L.A. So we flew a couple of times. Um, but we def- that was a lot of driving on that tour. Did you get to know Marco Mendoza? Yeah, um, he uh, he was great with us. I think he was really he he liked his Red Bulls on oh that tour. He always He's... had a Red Bull with him. <laughs> He's so much fun. I interviewed him two weeks ago for oh, this cool. show, and uh, yeah. he's fantastic. He was so much fun. All of them were. They were a lot of fun to hang out with, um, and they all had their own road stories and you know things they were telling. You know, they were always hyping us up before the gig, like "Go get them!" and uh, yeah, they were super cool. And we'd always stick around and watch their set, and they always they always put on a great show. So that was a lot, a lot of fun. So much fun. And I was just thinking about, I saw you play Don't Let Me Down mm. on the Kiss Cruise. Yeah. Look, look like you're an upper deck. I felt like, you know, in a sense, you're singing a Beatles song. The Beatles were on a roof. You're on a cruise ship. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, like the parallels. Full circle. Yes. Yeah, oh, it's, of course. It's, it's full circle again. So what was that experience like the kiss cruise was really really fascinating and a, a lot of fun but i don't think any of us ha- certainly evan knew because he I, I don't know if you know but he's paul's son so he was obviously acclimated <clears throat> to being in that situation uh we had not we had not done anything like that before so you know, you could ask us what we expected, but we had no idea what to expect. So once we got there and found that everybody was incredibly nice and warm and welcoming to us, you know, here's four young skinny guys playing pop music on a boat filled with Kiss fans. I mean, it sounds like a dream almost. It sounds like I woke up and then I was on a boat and we were a band and we were but there were people with kiss makeup at our show it was just so strange (laughs) but it was so much fun too uh to get to i love boats personally so to get to hang out on a boat and then to play music with my friends was like so cool and then to have them be so welcoming to us and just such a warm reception at all of our shows was really really great and i i loved doing those cruises both of them yeah, uh, it's like Alice, you know, through the looking glass. Mm-hmm. Just like that. We fell down the rabbit hole and wound up on a Kiss Cruise. <laughs> yeah, and then I saw you playing with Paul and Evan at a little private show that looked like a lot of fun. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, that's definitely one to add to my resume. Got to play with Paul Stanley on stage. Yeah, for sure. And the other thing is... When I look at all this stuff, because these are dreams coming true. Mm -hmm. And my uncle says, the sky is always blue. Clouds come, clouds go. And it's life if you can adapt to change. And, you know, you have this great thing going. And then a member leaves the band. Yeah. And so tell me a little bit about that. And it's. Because reading your bio, I look at it like this. Wherever, you know, the magic comes, it, it, it comes from. And you are very much a part of that. And also, and, and I've been through it, you know, on my level. I thank God punk music exists so I can be a part of the music scene. <laughs> but <laughs> There you go. You know, but how, how was it, you know, when you lost Evan, et cetera. And then the regrouping, because that took time and a lot of bands go through it, you know, and then it seems like, Hey, you found your way again. Yeah, it was, uh, that was a really, really tough experience at first because, you know, he, he was really the reason we were a band and we were coming together in the first place. Um, and certainly a lot of those experiences that we just talked about, you know, came through him and his connection. Um, you know, we were successful at them because we worked our asses off to really make sure that we stood our ground and made sure that we, you know, let the audiences know that we deserve to be there. 
but certainly the connections helped with a lot of that and he wrote basically all the songs and he was our front man and he played a lot of the solos and sang all the songs so to lose that was really i mean the our entire act was gone at that point because we weren't gonna start doing those same songs again you know i i couldn't picture myself singing his songs and would we just feel like a cover band so it was really um it was a question of okay this happened it's it's definitive he's out we're a three-piece now now what do we do we've got to do something so at first we toyed with the idea of getting a fourth member and we did play with one or two people, but it just never felt right. Because like I said earlier, we have a, a dialogue between us that is, it's our own language. And if someone doesn't quite know how to speak it, it it's just not going to be a good fit. So we decided to stay as a trio. And then it was a question of, well, okay, now we need an entirely new set of music because all that's gone. So we, we started writing again um, as the three of us, you know, with input from other people just to try to, just to try to get new songs together. You never know who's going to come up with a good idea and who is, uh, you know, where these songs are going to come from. So you just start throwing everything you can at the wall, hoping that something will stick. And we ended up coming with like an hour of new music. And it was more in the, in the rock vein rather than a pop vein you know we weren't sure yet of what direction we were going to go in so we wrote a lot of kind of bluesy rock songs at that point because we were a trio so we thought you know maybe we could do that sort of you know that trio rock blues type thing and uh so it was fun for a little while but i think we all started getting a little tired of it like it didn't the songs themselves weren't so good that we were uh, like holding on to it, like oh, we gotta, we gotta keep these songs, we gotta release these. You know, it was it was a good set, but it wasn't. It just it didn't click yet. And it wasn't until we started working on the song that I think became. It was either Blue Light or Ready Player One. I don't remember which one actually came first, but it was one of those songs that we started writing, and we all kind of perked up when we started working on this song, we thought, oh, there's, that's, that's something we haven't really touched upon before. Like these, the concepts we were starting to write about and the style that we were starting to play in was definitely not at all what we were doing before. And so and that was about a year or so of tr developing this, this hour of music that we ultimately threw out completely. And finally, we clicked onto this this new sound, and that became what we do now. So like the blue light, the Ready Player One, that kind of sound that we have now. It took about a year to really come up with that and decide that this is definitely what our new sound and direction is going to be. So we put a thousand percent of our energy then into making a whole new set of music that aligned with those kinds of sounds. And, uh, and that's kind of where we're at now with, um, with our newest release, Ready Player One now being out. And we do have some, you know, plans to release more music this year. Um, how many, and it, how many songs do you have in waiting so far? Um, we have a bunch. We have a handful of songs that are recorded and in the can okay. and may, maybe just need a little tweaking in the mix, but they're basically done. Um, we're just kind of at the moment working on really the how because we're in such a such a strange situation with with the um, with this pandemic. You know, yes. none of us obviously <laughs> have any idea what is happening and uh, how to go about doing what we do with all of this happening and obviously trying to stay safe, um, but also not being able to play shows and not really being able to be together other than on Zoom, for example, or FaceTime or whatever it may be. So it, it, right now we're, we're, we're still writing, we're still planning releases, 
um, but it's really a lot of the how do we go about this? Okay, we've got a song, how are we going to release it? Okay, we've got a video to do, how are we going to do that? So it's a lot, we're in some planning stages right now for the next I think we'll be release. calling Nick for that, right? <laughs> oh, you bet. <laughs> Nick, if you're out there, we need you, buddy. If you're listening, give, give me a call. Yeah, so it's a, it's obviously it's a metamorphosis. You're going through changes and figuring it out and, you know, to come up with that sound and then to come out with these three songs with videos, it's great. And there's, there's more to come. Oh, you bet there's more to come. We definitely have more on the way. Uh, you know, we're just, uh, we're just in the planning stages for how and when they're going to come out. No, that's sweet. Do you still stay in touch with Evan? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I spoke to him um, last week, I think, because he has a couple of new singles out. So we were talking about that. And, El Camino. Yeah, we, we definitely El Camino came out, and um, he had like two or three others that came out before that. He had a cover of the um, the Maroon Five song "Memories" yes. with a fun video as well. So you know, we're we're doing our own thing. But we uh, we keep in touch, and uh, you know we're still on good terms. Thankfully, he's still a, a good buddy of mine. I think that's awesome and important. You know, just getting through and sharing things happen in life. What I think I've learned through doing these interviews is it's not so much just one band. There's a lot of people that go from band to band and play. Not so much hired guns, but you know. To be able to to move around, I think it's you know more acceptable now than it was before, maybe. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I mean, certainly, I mean, Serge for a while was also playing with um, uh, the Broadway singer Marine uh, Ramin Karamlu, yes. who we're also good friends with. So he would sometimes have to be like, "Hey guys, I gotta I gotta do a tour with Ramin." Uh, I won't be available from this date to that date. And we'd be like, all right, go have fun. Tell him we said hi. So he'd go do that. And uh, Jimmy also has some things on the side that he does. So it's not so much like uh, if you do something else, then it's it's not acceptable, you know. And certainly when Evan said, you know, that he wanted to do something else, we were like, you, you got to do what makes you happy. And I think that's uh, especially now during all of this, you know, the pandemic and everything that's happened and everybody's so upset all the time. And uh, I think people need to do what makes them happy now, more so than ever before, I think. You know, it's the perspective I didn't want. I had perspective before, you know, like bringing joy and kindness to people. And, you know, it's been really tough, but yeah, it is so needed. And, you know, as artists, that's what you're doing. Bringing good music, your sound, bringing it full circle I got to see a couple performances and again it's an understatement when I say tremendous musician I saw your piece by Eleanor Rigby oh <laughs> if I needed you. someone oh yes and in my life mm. so uh, for somebody who's yeah you know I mean amazing voice I think one of the videos it was all of you doing you and singing the song, which was uh, great. <laughs> yeah, so those those were. Um, I think most of those were pre dives. I'm not sure exactly when I released those, but it's been a while since I've done anything like that. I think that those were done during a period where I wasn't in a band and was just like, well, I can play all these things. I might as well make a video, and uh, so I did that, and I having been to film school i knew how to edit and uh, record sound so i was like all right let's let's make some let's make some youtube videos so i started doing those full band covers i did the like you said if i needed someone i also did sunshine of your love and yeah the acoustic video of um, my rendition of in my life uh so you, you can tell a lot of a lot of my music uh, influence is in 60s and 70s uh, rock and pop yeah. When I say groovy, they go, what do you think? You're from the 60s. I was like, well, I'm 800 years old. So, yes. <laughs> so, yes. Thank you. Thank you for catching on. I still say far out, man. Okay. <laughs> and why not? And looking at the, those videos myself, 
And when you talk about like some bands can be a really bad marriage and you're dealing with personalities, they break up on every level. Even oh, bands yeah. that make millions and millions of dollars, they can't quite get sure. along. Yeah. But you took the step to do the music that you like, even by yourself, which is a great thing. If you were to go back and talk to your former self at that age, what sort of advice would you have given them? Ooh. Um, if I were to give my younger self advice, I would probably say, be more open-minded now. Don't wait. Because I think nowadays, I am much more willing to listen to something new not even just like stuff that I've never heard of older music, but like current music as well that has been influencing what I write and what the band has been writing. I'm much more open to, you know, experimenting and listening to different kinds of things. Whereas when I was a bit younger, I was definitely set in my ways of, uh, I like this and I like that and that's it. And don't come near me with anything else. Right. Unless it's um, the who. That too. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, but that's probably what I would tell myself. Loosen up and listen to other stuff. Awesome. That is great words. Great words. We are sponsored by Carlino Guitars. How do you, how did you meet Eddie Carlino? I've, so I've never actually physically met Eddie. Um, but that was one of the connections made through Evan because Eddie does stuff for Paul. And uh, so like straps and guitars and things like that. And Evan got us that contact and we were texting just a few days ago, I think. Um, and he's made us some of uh, our favorite straps that we still use. Like he would contact us and be like, hey guys, I want to make you some straps. And we'd be like, cool. And he'd be like, okay, you guys design it. We're like, what? Okay. So we'd send him some ideas and he would, he would, you know, make them up on whatever program he does, and he'd send us a, a what do you think about this? And we're like, that looks awesome. So he'd make them, and then he was like, guys, I want to make you guys some hats. And I was like, oh, okay. So he'd make <laughs> us, so he'd make us dive hats and send them to us. And so he's just, he's been awesome over the last few years with just, just kind of, just being there and being helpful and supportive. You know, there's to, too many times, you know, in the music business. I'm sure you know it's competitive and people don't want to lend you a hand or, you know, give you advice or anything. And then there's those people like Eddie who are just like, what do you guys need? I'll, I'll get it for you. You know, just give me your address and I'll send you a hundred dives hats, whatever you want. It's, and he's just been the coolest guy. So, but I have yet to actually meet the guy in person. So well, you're I'm invited looking, up. So when, oh, when this thing you. lifts, you know, we just when, get up here. I'm going to be wanting to do so much traveling when this is over. You have no idea. I want to, I want to see the world or at least Boston. I don't, <laughs> any place, any place <laughs> other than my bedroom would be lovely. I know. I mean, and that's, that's the whole thing about, you know, what we're doing with our time and being creative in the midst of it all, you know, and, and staying motivated. Uh, it's, it's been tough, but, you know, stuff like stoicism, I, I can't control people, places, or things. It's how I react to it. Um, mm -hmm. And then with all of that, because you've done a lot of stuff and you're going to do a lot more, do you, do you feel like, because I do talk to some musicians and they're always looking for the next thing. Do you feel like you've enjoyed the ride so far? Are you cognizant of it? Um, that's a good question. I'm def I've absolutely enjoyed it. Um, I don't think I'm at the point where I'm looking at the next plane of what to do next. Cause the band is so working so hard to really make this work, not being able to be together, not being able to play shows, uh, that I don't think any of us even has time to think about what the next sort of big thing would be it's more like we've got no choice but to get through this together until we can be together again so that's why i said you know we're always sharing writing ideas and coming up with 
social media things because we're trying to stay relevant on social media. We, as a matter of fact, we just got a TikTok, so go follow the Dives Music on Done. TikTok, please. Yes. <laughs> uh, coming up with all kinds of things to just stay, stay motivated, stay relevant, keep working. You know, just being persistent and always pushing each other too, because, like you said before, it can be very easy to become stoic and lose your motivation. So one of us will always be texting the group chat and like, okay, so what can we do today? Should we post something on this? Should we post something on that? Um, I've got a song idea. I've got this. Um, so it, it's, it's an interesting, tricky situation, but we're, we're working through it. And I have no doubt that when it's over, uh, I think we're going to come out stronger and better on the other side. No facts. And who came up with your logo? Oh, Pete Russo. Nice. Our buddy, our buddy Pete. We love him. He's a graphic designer. And uh, so we had an older logo. This is the, we have a new logo that we've been using since we've been doing this new sound and uh, our new direction as a trio. But the first logo, I'm actually not sure who, it was Evan's idea to do that sort of uh, kind of looked like handwritten dives with the arrow coming out of the the v and um but the current one was done by our buddy pete who's a friend of jimmy's uh and he did an amazing job with it we wanted something that had like a neon sign quality to it and so we have a couple of versions of it that we'll use depending on whatever promotion we're doing if we're doing a flyer or whatever so we have we have a version that's like glowing we have a version that has like cables going between the letters so it looks like a neon sign on a wall so it's a pretty cool logo and it looks great on jimmy's drum head so we're, we're really happy with it no that's spectacular mike i just want to thank you so much for joining melted and uh give thank my you best for having me oh no my pleasure give my best to jimmy and sergio and we look forward to some new music from you and then uh we open for you, so we uh, wish you much success. That's awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Frankie. No, this you, was awesome. It's good, to, it's good to connect finally. This is a year in the making, I think. <laughs> I think so. You're absolutely right. You know, when, when they told me, they, they sent me, because I rarely check the band email, because yeah. I, I, one of us is always checking it, but it's rarely me. Yeah. And they were like, hey, uh, some guy is uh, trying to contact you. And I looked, and... There was a, an email from a year ago, and I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. God damn it. Well, <laughs> again, timing is timing, my friend, and we just had, yeah. a, had a great hour. So you I appreciate just, it. You just have a great night, and we'll talk soon. For sure. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was Mike Lefton from The Dives. What a great trio. Jimmy Meyer on drums. Mike left in guitar and vocals, Sergio Ortega bass and vocals. They've done a lot of things. They're going to do some more stuff. I really, they're on TikTok. Jump on your TikTok and follow the dives. Uh, Ready Player One, new video, really awesome. I'm glad we got to discuss Ready Player One, Blue Light. And please, even though I have problems, you need to stop sending emails to my mom. And we want to thank you for listening. Boston Free Radio, Carlino Guitars, Mike Lefton. What a great night. I'm Frankie Melt Chapsticks Hollywood. You guys have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon. This podcast was produced in collaboration with the Boston Free Radio Podcast Network, part of bostonfreeradio.com and Somerville Media Center, Somerville's longest-running public access media center that enables a vibrant and diverse community to express its creativity, explain its ideas, share its cultures, and foster the individual right to freedom of speech. Learn more about Somerville Media Center at somervillemedia.org or check out some of the other amazing Boston Free Radio podcasts and radio shows at bostonfreeradio.com. Thanks for listening.